So as some of you might know, if you have been a part of our community, I have been a huge Clippers fan for a long, long time. Um, when they were really bad, when there was no one in the auditorium where they would offer opportunities to go play basketball on the court after the game, just so that you would show up for the game. It was that bad. And, and, and so I've had moments of great hope when they've brought in some great players and then moments of incredible disappointment. And, 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 and we had this team that no one knows and, and everyone would say there's no stars on this team and there are no all-stars for certain. And then we trade the only players we have that looked like they were kind of good. And everybody thought we were gonna get destroyed and they were playing the Celtics and I was watching yesterday, I think it was, and they were down by 28 points and I just couldn't take it anymore. You ever just had more pain than you could take? I know it's not life, but this was, it felt like life for me. And it was 28 points down. You have all these players that don't even know who they are and, and I changed channels. I said, no, I can't do this anymore. I gotta move on. I gotta leave this behind. I, 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 I just have to tap out. And, and then I go to our amazing girls conference because, you know, I'm a girl. And, uh, and so I'm, I'm there supporting the girls and, and because I love my wife and I love my daughter and I love all the girls. And, and then I come back home and the Clippers won. And it was really painful for me because I always, I always TiVo every game. But I didn't. I thought, I don't want a record of this. I'm, not, I'm never going to go back and watch this. I don't want to remember this. And, and then I hear, greatest comeback in Clipper history. <laughs> greatest loss in Celtic history. Clippers come back from 28 points down and win by 11. And I missed it. I think this is probably where so many of us actually miss God. See, when we feel like we are overwhelmed when we feel like there's no future, when we feel like we've just so messed up or life is just too hard, you just sort of check out. You, you tap out of your life. You tap out of faith and you go, I can't take this anymore. There's no way out of this. There's no way forward. There's no future. H have you ever made an internal decision without actually saying it externally? I'm just done. And that's one of the reasons I, I love the different moments that the scriptures capture, because you need to realize that the Bible is not all of God's history. The Bible actually captures a part of God's history. God has done so much more than what's written in the Bible. I hope you know that. Because God's still doing more than has been written in the Bible, and he's doing it in your life and in my life. And, and so you have to ask yourself, why are these moments captured in the scriptures? Why are these moments placed in the Bible so that we can have them forever? And a huge part of it is because the men and women in the scriptures face what we're going to face. But they face it at a level of intensity that is greater than most of us so that we can know that God is with all of us. Because let's be really honest, if the stories in the Bible were about people who, I don't know, they got a B, or they got a B in school and they got to go home and talk to their parents, you're like, really? You're worried about getting a B? I'm praying for a B and you don't understand my life, right? If the story was full of people who lived really comfortable, safe lives, and, and, and you know, if, the, if the Bible was like the suburban Bible, you know, where everyone lives in a nice house and has a nice job and, and has job security, works the same job for all of their life, and they know their, their, their parents and grandparents and great-grandparents and, and all their kids by the house next door, and, and that was the Bible, you go, yeah, that's great. I'm so glad God was there for them, but I don't have that life. See, I'm convinced the reason God gives us these particular moments in human history is that these moments are so intense that they cover us all. So the moment you go, yeah, no one understands my life. No one's been through what I've been through. No one, everyone would give up on God if they had to deal with what I have to go through. Well, just open the Bible. And you'll see your life isn't that bad. Because the people who walked with God faced greater challenges and greater difficulties than the ones you're facing right now. So if you remember nothing else today, I want you to remember something. No matter what you're going through, you're going to get through it. You with me? No matter what you're going through, you're going to get through it. And so here we are in the book of Daniel. 
in chapter one, and I'm gonna read verses one and two first, just to give you a little bit of context. It says, in the third year of the reign of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came to Jerusalem and besieged it. And the Lord delivered Jehoiakim, king of Judah, into his hand, along with some of the articles from the temple of God. These he carried off to the temple of his God in Babylon and put them in the treasure of the house of his God. Now, the reason he's giving us all that backdrop is to let us know this was a horrible moment in the history of Israel. Can, can you imagine a moment where you are living out a transition of peace to war, from security to violence, where everything in your life that you thought was going to be there tomorrow, everything you thought was certain, everything you thought was protected is now gone. And, and so... Daniel begins by letting us know it was this particular year. It was the year that Babylon came and destroyed Jerusalem and besieged it. It was the year that everything was turned upside down. It was the year that all the things that were placed in the temple of God that we thought were sacred, that we thought were protected by God, had now been stolen by another nation and placed in the temple of their gods. And remember back then they had this mentality, it was like God wars. My God's bigger than your God. My God's more powerful than your God. And we're going to prove that by going to war. And you have to understand the mindset of the Israelites were, if God cannot even protect his own temple, how in the world can God protect us? If God cannot stop the Babylonians from stealing what's in his temple and putting them in the temples of these false gods, how in the world is God ever going to meet us where we are? And I think so many times in life, we don't think God can meet us in real life. But something happens here, and I imagine everyone here is at least mildly familiar with the characters of Meshach, Shadrach, Abednego, and Daniel. And what I want to just say, take a few moments, because we're really going to start with the end of a particular moment, back to this beginning, and talk about those moments that are game changers. Because there are certain people who are game changers. And if you look at that, at that Clippers game, when they were up, down by 28, Kyrie Irving got hurt. He hurt his knee, and they took him out, and all of a sudden, Everything began to unravel for the Celtics. And I think this is what happens so oftentimes in life. See, all the Celtics looked like they were playing at a high level, playing so well that they were winning by 28. But when they extracted Kyrie Irving, you actually saw the level at which they were playing. They could not handle the level of adversity and the level of challenge that was now in front of them. See, I think what happens is so oftentimes we think we have faith, but because our lives are so secure, because our lives are so safe, because our lives are so comfortable, our faith is never challenged. So we actually think we're, we're in a zone. And me and God, we're just doing awesome. Look at me. But the moment something shifts, you unravel. See, the measure of your faith is not what it looks like when your life is working out the way you want it to work out. The measure of your faith is what it looks like when everything is falling apart and you're completely disappointed with God, wow. with life and with yourself. So I want you to know the whole world is falling apart and this is the moment these individuals rose up. You might know the end of the story. There's a lot of scripture there, so I've got to kind of go to the end where it says that these three guys, they Meshach, Shadrach, and Abednego, great names, I think they should be way more popular, but, but they're, 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 they've angered King Nebuchadnezzar because they refused to bow to worship their gods, and, and, and those who worship false gods got into Nebuchadnezzar's spirit, and they told him, you know, these three guys, they will not give you the homage you deserve, the glory you deserve, the worship you deserve. So Nebuchadnezzar calls them over, says, look, I'm going to give you a chance to bow down and worship my gods, and if you don't, I'm going to throw you into this furnace. And they basically said, really, this is not a negotiation we're never going to bow before your gods. Makes Nebuchadnezzar mad. He raises up the, the temperature on the furnace so hot as if fire wasn't bad enough. And, and it made it so hot that even the soldiers who were guarding these three men were consumed by the flames, which is pretty hot. They get thrown to this furnace and they live. I know. I just told you the end. <laughs> and I think most of us would love to have a life where we could be thrown into a furnace and live. But, but their life didn't begin there. See, the, the, the life that was lived that allowed them to step into that reality began long before. See, I, I think a lot of us, we want the game changer of who we are, the game changer of our life to happen when we're in the crisis. 
But if you're already in the crisis, you're already behind the game. Because you have to decide who you're going to be before the crisis. Because who you become before the crisis is who you will be in the crisis. It will just be revealed in the crisis. So I, I want to give you just a process of how you can become the game changer. You can become the person who changes the environment. You can be the person who changes the quality of what it means to be human, what it means to have faith. Because what I hope for us, because there, there's some great churches, and so many great churches in this area. So I thought, why are we here? And I thought a huge part of it is that we want to be a game changer. And there's some of you who are enjoying sitting by the fireplace of faith that I want to shift you from sitting by the fireplace to walking into the fire. I want to call you to something more than perhaps what you've been living in. And so it goes on in verse 3. It says, Then the king ordered Ashpenaz, chief of his court officials, to bring into the king's service some of the Israelites from the royal family and nobility. Young men without any physical defect, handsome, showing aptitude for every kind of learning, well-informed, quick to understand, and qualified to serve in the king's palace. He was to teach them the language and literature of the Babylonians. The king assigned them a daily amount of food and wine from the king's table, and they were trained for three years, and after that, they entered the king's service. And among those who were chosen from Judah were Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. And what I think is so fascinating about this beginning point is that they've spent the entire life preparing for a future they never imagined would happen. And have you ever felt like if you just knew what God wanted for your life, you would be ready for it? If you could just get a little advance notice of what God really is going to need from you in 10 years, you would start preparing now. But you don't know. See, if you want to be a game changer, you need to know your stuff. But you don't know what the stuff is. And so a lot of us find ourselves poorly prepared for the critical moments in life because we did not prepare before that moment came. You see, these men, it says they were, they were without any physical defect. They were handsome, showing aptitude in every kind of learning. You say, well, wait a minute. I can't, I can't help it if I have a physical defect. You can't. I can't help it if I'm not handsome. Well, you're telling me. But you can help it if you have aptitude for every kind of learning. So you can decide whether you're going to be a learner. It says they're well-informed. You can decide if you're well-informed. Quick to understand, you can decide whether you're teachable and qualified to serve in the king's palace. See, he went and looked for those who had spent their life preparing for a life they thought they were going to have. If you want to be ready for that moment where God wants to throw you in the game, that moment where God needs you to step up, that moment where you need to elevate what everyone else is living in and walking and believing in, you need to begin to know your stuff now. But you don't know the stuff you need to know, so let me tell you the stuff you need to know. You need to be faithful and diligent and excellent in whatever is in front of you right now. Yeah. I didn't even know who Jesus was when I was studying philosophy in college. I didn't know who Jesus was when I went to University of North Carolina. Then I just came to Jesus and didn't know what my life would be about. And I could look back on my life and think to myself, if God had just told me ahead of time, I could have been better prepared. But the reality is, some of you are not prepared for the moment you're in right now because you took too passively the challenges and opportunities you had in your past. Whatever you're doing right now, I don't know if you're a student, I don't know where you work, I don't know what kind of career you have, I don't know what kind of ambitions you have, but this is what I do know. Whatever you're doing, you're supposed to be doing it better than anyone in the world. You're supposed to be doing it the best of your ability. You're supposed to be giving everything you have. If you're a follower of Jesus, you need to be a person who says, I'm going to set the standard of what it means to be the best of the best of the best in whatever I do. I have a friend who is now the pastor of one of the largest churches in South America. But for the first 40 years of his life, he was an engineer. Well, not the first 40, the first 20, he was a child. And then he became an adult and became an engineer. And then for the next 20 years of his life, he was an engineer. And he never imagined he would become a pastor. He came to faith and he became good friends with the pastor. And here's this engineer now developing a heart for God. And then he becomes a pastor and takes all of his engineering background and engineers a community so beautiful, it has a massive impact. And when they had a cultural challenge in their nation... They mobilized two million people 
to stand against their government to say, we're going to be committed to families. We're going to be committed to the beauty and wonder of what it means to be human. You're not going to steal from us our humanity. I wonder, who else but an engineer could have mobilized people like that? See, God never wastes what you're learning. And so whatever you're learning, whatever you're, you're, whatever's in front of you right now, don't use Jesus as an excuse to be average. Wow. I, I, I felt that turbulence in my own life when I came to faith. I, was, I had finished uh, every, all my credits for philosophy and finished my degree in, in uh, psychology. And I only had one year left of Carolina, University of North Carolina. And then I became a follower of Christ. And then I was going to go to seminary. And, get, and I wasn't going to go to seminary. I was going to go to Yale. I was going to go to law school. Not because I wanted to be a lawyer, just because I thought it sounded awesome. Because I wanted to say, yes, I went to Yale. I just thought it sounded awesome. And, uh, and I, went, I wanted to go to law school because I love Perry Mason. He was a lawyer. And, and uh, in that TV show, it's, I thought, that, that sounds like a good thing to do. And, and this, when I applied to seminary, their standards were so low that I thought, I don't even have to pass another class. I could fail every class and still qualify to get this master's degree. It actually affected my relationship to excellence because so little was demanded of me. Wow. And I, I found myself floating through my last semesters of college because I thought, you know, Christianity doesn't really expect much. And I had to really get confronted by who Jesus is because whatever anyone else expects of you, Jesus expects the best of you. So you need to know your stuff. You need to prepare to be the best. And when you do that, you will be a game changer. You may be an architect or a teacher. You may be a healthcare nurse or a doctor. You may be a barista or a painter. But aspire to be the best. Know your stuff and watch how God translates that. And then he goes on to say in verse 8, But Daniel resolved not to defile himself, not to defile himself with the royal food and wine. And he asked the chief official for permission not to defile himself in this way because they were going to feed them food that was first offered to their gods. And so Daniel decided, we're not going to eat that food. So in verse 9 it says, Now God had caused the official to show favor and compassion to Daniel, but the official told Daniel, I am afraid of my, my lord the king who has assigned you food and drink. Why should he see the young, you looking worse than the other young men your age? The king would then have my head because of you. Daniel said to the guard, whom the chief official had appointed over Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, please test your servant for 10 days. Give us nothing but vegetables to eat and drink water. Then compare our appearance with that of the young men who eat the royal food and treat your servants in accordance to what you see. So he agreed and they tested them for 10 days. At the end of, ten, of the 10 days, they looked healthier and better nourished than any of the young men who ate the royal food. So the guard took away their choice food and wine that they were to drink and gave them vegetables instead. Now, now a lot of people used to say, you see, God wants everyone to be a, a, a vegan. <laughs> I, I just reject that. I just speak <laughs> against that right now. And uh, as a committed carnivore, I, I, I just want to say that I, um, I'm struggling with this passage. But... Uh, <laughs> This is not about whether it's right or wrong to eat meat, but it is about whether it's right or wrong to position yourself where anyone except for Jesus can be given credit for your life. See, what they understood is that the mindset, the worldview of the king and their leaders was, we're going to feed you food and wine offered to our gods so that our gods can make you what we need you to be. And the reason they didn't eat that food or drank that wine it's because they wanted to make sure that if they elevated, if they rose above the rest, that the only one who could be given glory and honor is the living God. So whatever you decide to eat, whether you're a vegan or whether you're a carnivore, whether you're, and I, I, I'm a vegan once removed. I only eat animals that eat vegetables. And uh, <laughs> think about it just for a minute. Like, and... Uh, But you, you need to understand that you need to know your source. You see, if you're going to be a game changer, you need to know your source. You, you, you need to understand that you not only need to know your source, but you need to know yourself. You need to know your identity. Yeah. See, and, and with these guys, they understood 
that this king would see what they contributed as being sourced by their gods. And what they wanted to make sure was that if they had something to contribute to this king, they would be forced to give glory to God himself. I think there's a, a, like a psychological disease or, or disorder in America. I, I call it sick because of its abbreviations. It's situational identity crisis. You see, what I think a lot of us have is we have situational identity crisis. When we're in a place like this, when we're in what we call church, our identity is all about Jesus. And then when we go to work, our identity is all about our work. And, and then when we're with our friends, our identity is all about partying. And then when we go somewhere else, our identity is all about what everyone else's identity is. And I wonder how many of us have situational identity crisis where your identity is actually reshaped by whoever you're around. The other day I was sitting with Cam and and I always try, when we're sitting together, she doesn't like to watch the things I watch. So I always try to find something I think she might like. And sometimes I'm right, sometimes I'm wrong. If it's BBC, I know I'm right, you know. <laughs> and if it's Sense and Sensibility or Downton Abbey or whatever else was made in England. But, uh, and slow. <laughs> with nothing exploding. And no progress. I know my wife will love it. And, uh, and, and but, uh. So I, I was going through and there was nothing on. So I saw this old uh, movie called Runaway Bride. And so I, I turned it on and about 20 minutes in, she goes, do you like this movie? <laughs> I went, no. She goes, well, neither do I. Why are you watching it? And I, and I thought to myself, I've been going through pain for 20 minutes for nothing. And, but, but, I, but I was captured by something because Julia Roberts plays this character and she keeps almost getting married, almost getting married, almost getting married, almost getting married, almost getting married. And each time, she changes what kind of eggs she likes. And so she likes an, an all whatever white omelet, if that's what he likes. She likes poached eggs, if that's what he likes. She likes scrambled eggs, if that's what he likes. And, and, and the huge underlying narrative is you don't even know what kind of eggs you like. Because each time you just conform to whoever you want to love you. You see, the great danger in your life is that you will actually not lie to others because that's really not the fundamental issue, is that you will lie to yourself. And if you keep lying to yourself because you keep trying to be what everyone else wants you to be, you will never know who you were supposed to be. And I, I, I think it's interesting because I want you to notice, in verse 7 it says, the chief official gave new names to Daniel, to um, Belshazzar, to Hananiah, to Shadrach, to Mishael, and he gave each one a name, Meshach, Shadrach, and Abednego. And so they changed the names of each one of them from their Hebrew name to their Babylonian name because they wanted to tell them, we are now the source of your identity. We're going to tell you who you are. In the same way you need to know your stuff and you need to know your source because you need to live your life in such a way where you know that your strength is coming from your relationship with God and that everyone in your world will know that your why is that you're living your life for Jesus. You also need to know yourself and you need to know your identity and make sure that your identity is not being constantly reshaped by whose attention or whose approval you need. Do you know who you are? You know, you guys know that I'm an immigrant from El Salvador. And, uh, and I, I, I never even really knew my real name. You know, I, I knew my grandparents because they were the ones that first raised me. And I, I, so I knew a lot about our family. But when I went to school, because I had an alias, because my name is Erwin McManus, but I'm not German or Irish. And, uh, and every year, the kids would say, the teacher would say, go around and say your names. And everyone would go, hi, I'm Joe Smith. Hi, I'm Kevin Pena. Hi, I'm, you know... Eric Roy. And, and, and I would say my name is Erwin McManus. Because I didn't know who I was, I just knew what my name was. But I knew that I wasn't what my name was. And, and a huge part of our life struggle is trying to root our identity in what other people expect of us, what they want of us, or what we think we need to become to be loved by them, accepted by them, admired by them, valued by them. And you need to root your identity in no one except for Jesus. And when your identity is rooted in him, you do not suffer with situational identity crisis. 
Are you the same person in every room? You know what's exhausting? Not knowing who you are. Because you have to keep trying to put someone else on every time you enter a different room. It is so tiring. You ever found yourself being the wrong person because you forgot to change who you were? I love what Mark Twain said. He said that, um, that liars have to have great memories. I remember that years ago because I, you know, I, I have um, memory issues and so, and, uh, because of the way my brain works. And so one of the things I had to decide a long time ago is that since I don't know if I can remember everything, I just need to always tell the truth. And that way I don't have to remember anything. All I need to do is tell the truth. See, if you tell the truth, you don't have to remember what you said. If you tell the truth about who you are, you don't have to remember who you were. They tried to rename them. They tried to redirect them. They tried to resource them. But they knew who they were. If you want to be a game changer, you need to know your stuff, and you need to know your source, and you know yourself. This is one of those rare days where everything kind of rhymes. <laughs> but if you go all the way forward to where we started in Daniel chapter 3, you need to know your story. Because you need to know what story you're in. And I think this is where so many of us lose the game. This is where a lot of us begin to fall apart. In Daniel chapter 3, beginning of verse 9, it goes back to the situation where the men went to Nebuchadnezzar and told him, hey, there's these Israelites and they refuse to bow. They will not pay attention. They will not serve your gods. They will worship your, the image of your God that you've set up. And he was furious with rage. And Nebuchadnezzar summoned them all to come and said, is this true? Verse 14, Meshach, Shadrach, and Abednego, that you do not serve my gods or worship the image of gold I have set up. Now, when you hear the sound of the horn, flutes, zither, lyre, harp, pipe, and all kinds of music, if you are ready to fall down and worship the image I, I, I've made, very good. But if you do not worship it, you'll be thrown immediately into a blazing furnace. You know, some of you really want clarity in your life. Wouldn't you love this kind of clarity? You either worship my God or I'll kill you. See, it's, it's, it's so clear. And it's really so much easier to know where you stand. And, um, and then he says this, and this is the gauntlet then what God will be able to rescue you from my hand? Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego replied to him, King Nebuchadnezzar, we do not need to defend ourselves before you in this matter. If we are thrown into the flaming, blazing furnace, the God we serve is able to deliver us from it, and he will deliver us from your majesty's hand. But even if he does not, we want you to know, your majesty, that we will not serve your gods or worship the image of gold you have set up. Now, this is so critical. Now, the ending kind of messes us up. Honestly, it might have been more helpful to us if they had went into the furnace and just poof, got lit up. And go, wow, that was quick. Right? You see, the way we read these stories is every time we get thrown into the fire, we live. So we have this false narrative that if you trust God, you always succeed. You never fail. You always get it right. You never get it wrong. And, and so some of you actually don't even know that you've been in the furnace because you got a little burnt. What they were saying was not, we know we never get burnt. You see, you trust God, you go into the furnace, you live. Do you know that's not real life? You know why this is in the Bible? Because it's rare. Most of the people thrown into the furnace did not come out. But what is so significant is the story they were in. They said, you don't understand. We, under, we know our intention. We know why we exist. We know our purpose for being here in this moment. It actually doesn't matter how the game plays out for us. You're the only one on the line. This is what's amazing. They didn't see themselves actually in danger. They saw Nebuchadnezzar in danger. They said, we, we know what our life is about, whether, you, whether we live or not. And said, by the way, we know that our God can actually deliver us. I hope you know that. That there's no circumstance, no situation, no problem in your life that God cannot get you out of. Yeah. Before I met Jesus, whenever I made a terrible mistake, when I would mess up, you ever just feel like you were suffocating because you just blew it and you got caught? I'd have to sit back and just tell myself, in 20 years, this isn't going to matter. But you see, you can get past the choice by making new choices. But in 20 years, it will still matter if you don't get past the character that made the wrong choice. See, what they're saying is, our God is with us because we are with him. We are walking with God. So if we go into the furnace, he can deliver us. But even if he does not, it has no bearing on our life. I want to ask you, 
So you want to be a game changer? You want to be the kind of person God uses to change the temperature in the room? Do you want to be the kind of person that moves people from sitting by the side place to jumping into the fire? Do you want to be the kind of person that actually can be trusted by God to create a future only God can imagine? Then you have to decide to be the person who knows who you are. You understand your intention. You know your purpose. You're not just here to exist. You're not just here to survive. You're not here to find a safe, comfortable, easy, predictable life. You're here to live the life that only you and Jesus could live together. And what they're saying is that we're going into the fire because we know that's where God is calling us and he will meet us there. And he might meet us there when we get consumed or he might meet us there as we walk back out. But there's no question we're going in this direction because you're always going in the direction of God. So they throw him in the fire because they didn't go well. And it, it tells us that um, Nebuchadnezzar is furious and he changed his attitude toward them. And he ordered the furnace heated seven times hotter than usual and commanded the strongest soldiers in the army tie them up and throw them into the blazing furnace. And so these men wearing their robes, trousers, turbans, and other clothes were bound and thrown into the flaming, blaming, blazing furnace. The king's command was so urgent and the furnace was so hot that the flames of the fire killed the soldiers who took Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And the three men, firmly tied, fell into the blazing furnace. Then Nebuchadnezzar, King Nebuchadnezzar, leaped to his feet in amazement and asked his advisors, weren't there three men that were tied up and threw into the fire? They replied, certainly, your majesty. He said, look, I see four men walking around in the fire, unbound and unharmed. And the fourth looks like a son of God. They were unbound and untied. Now, if I'd been bound and tied and thrown to a furnace and was still alive, and I found myself unbound and untied, I'd be running out of the furnace. I would not be hanging around in the furnace going, wow, isn't this interesting, you know? You know, and then if there's a fourth person, I'm not like, hey, who are you? What's happening? I, I'm running out of there as fast as humanly possible. But they're not in a hurry. You know why? Because, you see, when you're in the fire with God, you're exactly where you want to be. Wow. But there's some people who would rather just stay out of the fire without God. And, and I want you to understand something, that when, when you decide to trust Jesus with your life, he doesn't find a way for you to avoid the fire. Because fire is coming. He just wants to walk there with you. I love how it, it continues. In verse 26, Nebuchadnezzar then approached the opening of the blazing furnace and shouted, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, servants of the Most High God, come out! Come here! So Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego came out of the fire. I think I would have said, no, oh, you come in. <laughs> it's toasty. And the satraps, prefects, governors, and royal advisors crowded around them. They saw that the fire had not harmed their bodies, not, nor was a hair on their head singed. The roads were not scorched, and there was no smell of, smell of fire on them. Then Nebuchadnezzar said, Praise be to the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who has sent his angel and rescued his servants. They trusted in him and defied the king's command and were willing to give up their lives rather than serve or worship any god except their god. Therefore, I decree, this is the king who wanted to worship false gods. He says, therefore, I decree that the people of any nation or language who say anything against the God of Meshach, Shadrach, and Abednego be cut into pieces and their houses be turned into piles of rubbers, rubble. I don't think that's a great idea either, but for no God can save in this way. Then the king promoted Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego into the province of Babylon. And these individuals who were thrown into a fire who were seen as disposable human beings were now elevated to be the light that God always called them to be. There's some of you here, you actually do feel like a disposable human being. You feel like you've just messed up too much. You made too many mistakes. You've blown it too many times. And, and, and there's some of you here that you know the, um, the pain of being given up on by a, the people that, that were closest to you. And I know that. And, and here's the beauty. These three men 
were seen as disposable human beings. Just throw them into the fire like garbage. But God used that moment to elevate them because they were willing to trust them, trust him with their lives. As I drove down here today, in fact, the last thing this region needs is another church. It's just, there's so many great churches here. And, and so let's, let's be game changers. Let, let's change the temperature in the room. Let, let's risk in such a way that we look out of our minds. Let, let's make decisions that, that call us to a great adventure and to great challenges. And let's listen to the voice of God as he calls us forward. And, and even if everyone else thinks we're out of our mind, let, let's, let's live a life that is destined to failure unless Jesus shows up. See, I, I, I don't want to live a life that can be measured by my intelligence or talents or education. I don't want my life to be measured by what's inside of me within my own human capacity. I'm grateful for whatever God's placed in me. And you should be grateful for the talent and gifting and intelligence inside of you. But I'm telling you, God wants you to live a life that when people look at you, they go, there's someone else in the room besides you. Someone else got involved besides you. I want them to look at your life and see the fire and say, who's the fourth man? Who's that other person in the room? The Celtics lost because Kyrie got hurt. I, 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 I'm not, you know, a huge fan all the time, but it's just inescapable. Every time LeBron gets on the court, everyone gets better who's on his team. I want to be that kind of person, but not in a basketball game, but in real life. I want to be the kind of person that when we walk together, you get better. I, I want us to be the kind of people that do bad math. When three people walk together, everyone sees a fourth. When two people walk together, everyone sees a third. When we walk together as a community, everyone else knows there is more going on than just us. Let's change the math. Let's get into the fire and watch God show up. That's why we're here. We're not here to sit by the fireplace. We're here to walk into the fire. Come on, let's just thank God for that. Amen. Amen. Would you just bow your heads to me just for a moment? Just close your eyes. You may be here today and um, you've never crossed the line of faith and trusted Jesus with your life. You know something's missing. You've felt it for a long time. Something's broken, something's wrong. You know, the Bible talks a lot about sin. And one of the reasons is because sin is what we fill all the emptiness inside of us that only Jesus can actually heal. So you may be here and you know you need forgiveness and you need freedom. But more than everything, you need a future and a hope. I'd like to invite you to cross the line of faith to give your life to Jesus because 2,000 years ago, he gave his life for you. And he's just waiting for you to receive his life by giving him your life. If you're ready to do that, I want to lead you in a simple prayer. I'm just going to lead you in one sentence. It's not everything you and God need to talk about. That, that conversation is going to last forever. But it begins here. Right now, I just want you to pray this simple prayer. Jesus, I give you my life. Right now, just tell him. Jesus, I give you my life. Just whisper to him. Jesus, I give you my life. I want to be real clear as you pray. Religion tells you that your faith will bring you comfort. But Jesus tells us that your faith will give you courage. So if you choose to cross the line of faith, if you choose to follow Jesus, 
get ready because life is going to be full of risk. It's going to be challenges and adventure. There'll be ups and downs, times of joy and times of sorrow, great victories and painful failures. But you will never, ever, ever do it alone. So right now, just whisper to him, Jesus, I give you my life. Jesus, I give you my life. If this is your prayer, I want to pray for you. If you just whisper to God, Jesus, I give you my life, I want to pray for you right now, but I want you just to hold your hand up high. Just be courageous right now. Beautiful. Wonderful. Anyone else? Jesus, I give you my life. Beautiful. Anyone else? Right now. Beautiful. Anyone else? Jesus, I give you my life. Wow, so good. Anyone else? Right now, this is your moment. Jesus, I give you my life. Let him take you to a life that you will never know without him. Beautiful. Wonderful. Jesus, I give you my life. Anyone else? Father, I thank you for the women and men who in this moment have opened up their life to you. And God, I pray that right now you would just wrap them up in your love and let them know that they belong to you, that you will never leave them or abandon them. And God, I, I do not pray that you will give them away around the fire. I pray that you'll give them away through the fire. I pray that they will live the kind of life that will be so powerful, so courageous, so inspiring, so passionate, so fully alive that everybody in their life will come to them and say, what in God's name has happened to you? And they'll be able to respond, that's exactly right. It's Jesus who's changed my life. God, I pray that they would be the beginning of a brush fire. That you would fill them with passion. I pray that every morning they would wake up so ready to live. That they would be filled with anticipation and excitement for life. And God, I pray that every single person in this room right now will refuse to simply exist and begin to live. I pray, Father, that they would never turn to faith to give them comfort and security, but would turn to faith to give them courage and faith. That, God, they would find a bravery within themselves to get up and live the life that you created them to live. God, we want to be game changers. We want to be the kind of people that when you put us in the game, everyone gets better and so father if you need to turn the world upside down make our circumstances harder we're ready we're here we want to be the people you can trust with the great challenges of life so that the world can know that Jesus is who he claims to be we thank you father we pray in Jesus name Amen. Can we just thank God so much for all those who responded to him? So good. So beautiful. This is so exciting. Beginning of new things. I love being a part of the beginning of new things. There's nothing like it in the world. There's something beautiful about not being able to predict what's going to happen next, but moving together with courage and confidence. Let's do this together. Let's do together what no one could ever do alone. And let's watch Jesus meet us here and surprise us all by how good he is to us. Let's all stand together and have a closing song.